All right, everybody, thank you so much for uh, attending our uh, members town hall today. Um, I wanted to uh, just acknowledge some folks who are here, uh, certainly thank and welcome uh, all of you who were um, able to hop on this evening and everyone who's uh, going to be watching this later. We will be posting this uh, online as well. Um, I'd like to start by uh, thanking uh, and welcoming all of our state directors and group leaders who have been able to join us today. Um, we have a really fantastic network of state directors all across the country, uh, as well as uh, hundreds of affiliates, and I see many familiar faces um, on, the, uh, on the call today, so thank you so much for joining us. Uh, in addition, we have a lot of board members from American Atheists on the call, including our board chairman, uh, Neil Carey. Uh, including Mandisa Thomas, uh, president and founder of Black Nonbelievers, uh, and uh, a number of other uh, folks that I just saw kind of perusing the, the list of folks who have joined us. Um, let me transition into introducing some of our uh, staff who will be speaking uh, in this town hall. Let me start with Samantha McGuire. Uh, Samantha McGuire is the national field director for American Atheists. She'll be kind of moderating things today, talking a little bit about uh, some of our work in the field, uh, and we'll just be running point on getting our getting your questions answered. Um, also, we have Allison Gill, Vice President for Legal and Policy. Uh, Allison has been with us now for about two years and is uh, going to be talking about some of our successes in the policy arena uh, in both the states and in the federal government, uh, as well as some projects that we have coming up uh, and a report on uh, the survey that we did. Uh, we also will have uh, Jeffrey Blackwell. Uh, Jeff is our litigation counsel. Jeff will be discussing our uh, work in the courts, uh, some of our successes over the past year, uh, the work that we've done, uh, cases that we have pending, and talk about our plans for the next year. And also Debbie Goddard, Vice President for Programs. Uh, Debbie oversees our field uh, communications and other programs, um, and we'll be talking about some of the metrics that we'll be looking at, our convention coming up in 2021, uh, as well as some other things. So um, thank you all for joining us once again. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to Samantha McGuire uh, to give you all some information about how to uh, navigate this webinar and make sure your questions get answered. Uh, and then we'll take it from there. Great. Thanks, Nick. So good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining us today at the Member Town Hall. This is the first type of event we've done like this. Um, so I'm going to go over a couple housekeeping items just to make sure that you know how to interact with us while we're doing this event. Um, you're going to have the opportunity to submit text questions. Some of you have already found that feature. There is a box that says questions. You just type your question in there and then we will get to it at the end. If it's a question that's related to the presentation, we'll hold those to the end. If you're having trouble with something technically, then I'm going to try to uh, help you out if you if you need help. I know that most of the questions so far have been, we can't hear you. I'm gonna put elevator music on next time, I think, so that you guys know that we're here. So if you have a question, you just type it in there and send it over to us and, and we'll answer it at the end after we're done with our presentation. Also tonight, we're gonna have a few questions for you. So during the presentation, there'll be a couple times where we stop and launch polls and you'll have the opportunity to put your uh, appropriate response in there and then click submit. It will kind of take over your screen so you can't help but notice. Once the poll is closed, then we'll be able to share what the answers are that you guys have shared with us and um, that will hopefully keep it a little bit more interactive in this sort of format as opposed to our in-person event that we usually hold during the convention. Um, at the end of the meeting, when you close out, there'll be a questionnaire. We'd love it and appreciate it if you could complete that. There's just a couple of short questions to give us some feedback and, and see what you would like to see from us in the future. And then there'll be a follow-up email. We are going to be recording this. And so um, we will make sure that you get a link and you can um, send it out to your friends and know what we're up to. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Nick. Thanks, uh, thanks so much, Sam. Uh, I'm gonna pass it actually over to Allison, who's going to talk about our policy work and um, some of the, the exciting stuff that we have coming up. Allison is muted. <laughs> oh, there we go. All right, hi everybody. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. Thanks, Nick. So I'd like to begin by speaking a little bit about our advocacy work. Uh, 2020 has been quite an interesting year for advocacy so far. 
Um, American Atheists focuses the majority of our advocacy work at the state level. We work to empower state and local advocates to maintain the separation of religion and government, to protect the civil rights of atheists, and to fight back against efforts to undermine our constitutional rights, such as the Project Blitz campaign. About, although 2020 has been an unusual year, we've already tracked uh, 520 bills across 43 states that are relevant to our interests and concerns. So far, we've supported about 206 of those bills and opposed 280 of those bills. And I should say that about 100 of those bills, the negative ones, are associated with Project Blitz, who a lot of you might have heard about previously. The bills vary quite a lot from religious exemptions and In God We Trust in Schools bills, which mandate that schools put big posters that say In God We Trust them on them in every classroom, to more positive ones, like for example, bills to protect young people from child marriage or um, things like faith healing. So those have moved forward in some states. Some of the, the negative bills we saw this year were incredibly dangerous. One major trend we saw was that this year that there are bills that allow for denial of medical care based on religious beliefs. And these denial of care bills were much broader than we've previously seen, um, which is especially harmful given the current context. So you can imagine, you know, um, people being turned away because of their provider's beliefs in some states. Uh, for example, there was a bill that passed one of the chambers in Kentucky, and only through our efforts and working with our partners and our, our constituents and members being really active and, and participating and writing in, we were able to um, end the momentum on that bill and see it killed. We submitted testimony or had volunteers testify in person about 50 times between January and March of this year when, when most state legislatures closed down. Normally, um, that's, that's a higher number than we did previous year. And if we were on the same pathway as we were last year, we'd probably have a much higher number now. But uh, things have uh, been a little bit unique this year, we'll say. Um, on the other one hand, that means that not many of the bad bills are moving forward, which is good, but it also means that some of the more hopeful bills we were hoping to see pass have not yet done so. One important way our members have helped to engage in advocacy is through our action alert system, and I'm happy to report that the membership has really stepped up this year. Since our last convention, we issued 46 total action alerts targeting policy change at the federal, state, and local level. About 1,000, no, sorry, 13,600 constituents took part in these various actions which is more than a tenfold increase from the previous year. So that means more people are participating in these action alerts when they come up and doing so regularly. We've sent about 46,500 letters altogether to, were sent to lawmakers by our constituents, which is a, nearly a six-fold increase from the previous year. So altogether, we, our constituents, our members have been much more active and we're making much more of an impact through the systems. So my first question is, have you taken an action through our action alert system? Um, Sam, can you pop that up? I'd love to hear what you think of it. Take a quick minute, pop in your answers. We have about two thirds of you have voted. We'll give it another few seconds. Excellent. Okay. So we had about 60% said no and about 40% said yes. Wonderful. Well, this is good then. Um, I have great information then. If you're not getting our action alerts emails, we have a site set up where you can uh, sign up to receive action alerts. It's atheist.org slash act, A-C-T. So that's A-T-H-E-I-S-T-S dot org slash act. And then we made it very, very easy to sign up and get action alerts. So we're asking you not just to sign up, make sure you're getting alerts, but to send that out to friends and family. We have little um, 
tags at the bottom that you can easily post it on social media. The more people we have signed up in our system, we're able to reach out and get it, you know, uh, get people to take action. The more impact we're able to make, and the more we're able to influence lawmakers to, um, you know, to to put forward good policies and oppose bad ones. So by working together, we can really make a difference. Um, so I encourage you to please take actions. Um, we make it as simple as possible through our action art system. Really, it's just a matter of a few clicks most times. So, you know, when it pops up in your in your spam, we don't we don't send things out, you know, all the time. But when it does come up, if you can at least take a look at it and try to take action, we really do appreciate it. I think it makes all the difference. Um, let's see here. A few other things I wanted to highlight. In January of this year, we released a terrific new resource to support state advocacy called the State of the Secular States Report, uh, which is available at atheist.org slash states. That's S-T-A-T-E-S, -E states. This report looks at more than 40 different relevant state law issues that positively or negatively affect the separation of religion and government and the civil rights of atheists in every state plus DC and Puerto Rico. So it's really sort of the first of its kind resource for our issues. We published the first version of this back in 2018, and this is the second version that added uh, several, different more several different categories and also um, included Puerto Rico for the first time, which I think is really, was really great addition. So we hope this is a powerful tool for both advocates and for lawmakers to understand what is the state of the law in their states and how they can work towards change. Um, it's it's difficult for us to say, you know, we want to make these changes in the law without actually knowing what they are. So this is, real, I hope, a really useful tool for, for uh, local groups and also uh, local advocates. At the federal level, American Atheist has, has been a leader in pushing back against this administration's regulatory changes that undermine the separation of religion and government. One good example is the way Amer the administration has unconstitutionally diverted money to churches through the Paycheck Protection Program. And we've really been on the front line of calling this out. Our members have made clear to them made clear to the Small Business Administration as well as Congress that this is not acceptable and that we'll continue to fight to ensure that churches cannot help themselves to taxpayer dollars. So that's one issue we're really fighting actively right now, but there's been uh, numerous sort of administrative changes we've been fighting over these past several years um, that work to undermine the separation of religion and government. Lastly, I'm excited to say that next week we'll be releasing the first report of the results of the U.S. Secular Survey, which is a report is called Reality Check, Being Non-Religious in America. This survey was conducted last year with about 34,000 non-religious people from all across the country. And our membership really stepped up and made this possible by promoting the survey um, and, and getting it out there, as well as our partner organizations. I, I've been telling people, you know, we originally wanted 5,000 to 10,000 people to sign up and take the survey. And the first, I think, eight hours, we passed 10,000. 10, so all told, we had you know 34,000, which is what nearly seven times what we, what we were hoping to get, which is fantastic because the more people we get, the more stories we can tell. You know, the more people this represents, the more stories we have, the more the larger sector of the community we're hearing from. This was the largest survey of non-religious people um, done to date, and the research reflects the need for a much greater focus specifically on non-religious people, our needs, challenges, priorities, and our communities. There's been a lot of research on the broader category of nuns or religiously unaffiliated people, but this is not that. This is about uh, our, us, our communities, atheists, uh, free thinkers, skeptics, and other non-religious people. The results are striking. I found most interesting the, the difference in how non-religious people are treated in areas like New York that are not very religious compared to places like Utah and Mississippi where being an atheist is very stigmatizing. And as tempting as it is, I can't go into the results here, but I hope you all join us for the webinar we'll be doing on the report next Tuesday, the 5th at seven o'clock Eastern. Um, so that's my next question. Are you interested in joining us for the webinar? And if you say yes, we'll follow up, make sure to follow up and send you an email. So you should see that poll pop up ahead again. Go ahead and put your vote in. We have yes, register me. Maybe send me more information. No, I'm not available that day. Give it just a few more minutes, not minutes, seconds.
So we have about 85% folks have voted. And they say 82% say yes, register. 18% said maybe, and only 1% said no. So now we're gonna track you down, make sure you have the link, make sure that you register. We've, we've got proof you said you'd be there, so. Fantastic. Well, I hope to see you there. It's going to be a great, um, great webinar. It's going to be me and also the main primary researcher on the report is Dr. Samjin Frazier. Um, so she'll also be on the on the um, webinar as well. So anyway, that'll be next week. And that is it. I'll turn it over to the next person. Great. With that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Jeffrey Blackwell. Uh, good evening. Thank you, Allison. Um, sorry for the delay in, in unmuting there. I'm not sure what was going on. Um, we've had quite a few developments in the last year on the litigation side at the American Atheist Legal Center. I'm only going to have time to touch on a few of those developments, unfortunately, but here we go. Uh, first, in just the last couple of weeks, we settled our lawsuit in Ohio. That suit was filed on behalf of a family of a neuroatypical boy who suffered psychological setbacks after he was subjected to full immersion baptism against his parents' express wishes. Uh, the terms of the settlement agreement are confidential, uh, but the family is pleased with the outcome, as are we. Uh, we also had a number of successes this year outside of a courtroom. Two school districts, one in Texas and another in Ohio, agreed not to include prayers in their 2019 graduation ceremonies. A Georgia sheriff who had been using his official Facebook page to promote Christianity took down the page after we reached out on behalf of a resident of his county. And uh, a state college in Florida honored a nursing student's request not to be assigned to a religious health care provider that would have required her to counsel patients based on their religious tenets. The AALC also participated in numerous amicus briefs in the last year, both at the Supreme Court and in lower courts. In collaboration with Nick Little at CFI, we drafted an amicus brief in the upcoming Supreme Court case Tanzan v. Tanvir. That case has the potential to exacerbate the numerous constitutional problems created by the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, or RIFRA, a law that American atheists has opposed since before it was passed back in 1993, uh, even when many of our allies were supporting it. We also signed on to amicus briefs in several other Supreme Court cases, including American Legion v. the American Humanist Association, which most of you probably know better as the Bladensburg Cross case, uh, as well as Little Sisters of the Poor v. Pennsylvania, which is another RIFRA case, Our Lady of Guadalupe School v. Morrissey Baru, a case that risks expanding the ability of religious organizations to discriminate in employment, and Espinoza v. Montana Department of Revenue, a case about government subsidized, excuse me, government subsidized funding of private schools that was that has dangerous implications for the establishment clause. We expect to get a decision in that case in the coming weeks. In lower courts, we drafted an amicus in the Second Circuit case, New Hope Family Services v. Poole, regarding discrimination by religious adoption agencies. And we signed on to amicus briefs filed in the First Circuit case, Carson v. Macon, another school funding case, and the D.C. District Court case, Oracle v. Department of Labor, which could limit the ability of the government to enforce anti-discrimination laws. Our lawsuit against Arkansas State Senator Stanley Jason Rapert is advancing. We filed this lawsuit on behalf of atheists in Arkansas that were blocked from Rapert's official Facebook and Twitter accounts after they criticized him for his Christian nationalist actions and policies. Discovery in that case could start as early as this coming month. The Rapert suit is part of our Atheists Engage campaign to encourage atheists to communicate publicly and openly as atheists with elected officials and government agencies. It also marks the beginning of an effort by the AALC to pivot to a more proactive approach. As part of this shift, our attention is going to be focused more on advancing the law rather than simply reacting to the actions taken by Christian nationalists around the country. Well, we will be actively pursuing new opportunities for impact litigation, like the Rapert case. Uh, we'll be moving the Overton window through articles in law reviews and journals and weighing in on more cases through amicus briefs. In particular, we will be filing an amicus brief in the upcoming Supreme Court case Fulton v. City of Philadelphia, a case that could have sweeping ramifications and risks and risks exempting numerous religious entities from provisions in government contracts and also limiting the ability of government officials to criticize the actions of religious organizations. 
Finally, assuming the Supreme Court agrees to take up the case, we will also be filing an amicus in Knight First Amendment Institute v. Trump, the case challenging Trump's practice of blocking critics on Twitter. That case will have direct implications for our lawsuit against Senator Raybert. And with all that, I will hand it back over to Allison. Or to Nick or to whomever is uh, next. To someone, yes. Uh, thank you so much, Jeff, uh, for that very comprehensive rundown on all the work that uh, we've been doing. Uh, I certainly want to thank you for all your hard work uh, on all of our legal cases, as well as all the work writing, as, all the, as well as all the writing that's happening and all the uh, amicus briefs. It's uh, it's been really great, so thank you. Uh, with that, uh, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Debbie Goddard and Samantha McGuire to talk about our uh, field work and our community work. Okay, thank you. So. I'll start by mentioning two things before turning it over to Sam, which is to say that the biggest thing that we do every year to foster community and connect with our members is, of course, the National Convention, which had to be postponed until next year. One of the goals of the National Convention is to serve our members and have an impact in the area where it happens. So in the lead up to the convention, we do a lot of outreach. We connected with a lot of the volunteer are a lot of volunteers on the ground, both in the secular community and in allied communities, as well as local group leaders. We also connected with states in the region, not just Arizona, but California, Colorado, et cetera. Fortunately, we get a chance to work with these groups and volunteers and local leaders and organizations next year since the, since the conference is postponed. So make sure that's on your calendar for next Easter, 2021, April 1st through 4th. Of course, also in line with our activism and advocacy goals, we had more workshops and trainings scheduled for this convention. We did more last year as well, and we, we expanded this lot this year. We'll be rolling that over into next year, but Sam will also talk more about some of the trainings that we have offered throughout this year. In the last year, we also sponsored and participated in about 20 or more different regional, uh, regional secular conferences including events like Free Flow in Florida and the Kentucky Free Thought Convention, things like that, in focused national secular events like Women of Color Beyond Belief and in national conventions and other movements, including Creating Change by the National LGBTQ Task Force. By doing this, we reach thousands of people that we might not normally reach, and we have the chance often to speak, to present, to sign up new members, and to do things like workshops, trainings, which helps us build our list, doing the workshops and trainings helps us to advance our advocacy and activism goals, of course. Some of the workshops that we did included topics like how to do activism effectively, how to run a local community well, and how to share your story to change hearts and minds. We were looking to do more event sponsorships and participate in a greater number of events this coming year. Of course, that's all changed. So we're in part of the process for um, developing resources for local activists as well as group leaders, um, we're moving a lot of this stuff online, of course. We're doing more uh, webinars and other things, but I'll, I'll leave Samantha McGuire to talk more about that resource development. And with that, I'll turn it over to you, Sam. Thanks, Debbie. Yeah, so um, one of the things that we did right away in response to um, COVID, of course, is, is postpone our convention, but we also put together a resource for our local affiliate groups and volunteers on some of the different platforms that are available. And we've also made our own platforms available to our affiliates so that if anyone wants to hold a meeting on them um, on GoTo or Zoom or one of those, then we can help them do that. Um, so that brings me to the first thing I was going to talk about, which is our affiliate groups. Um, one of the things that we've spent a lot of time doing in the last year is doing more communication with our affiliate groups and growing that list. So we have added about 50 affiliates in the last year. We're up to about 230. Um, and we were at like 170 a year ago. And I'm going to drop into the chat or affiliate link so that if you are like, oh gosh, I didn't know you had that many groups everywhere, you can go and find your group near you. Um, and that's available on our website if you can't figure out where the chat is at atheist.org and activism slash affiliates. Um, so that's one of the things we're working on. And part of that is doing these webinars and trainings. We've had a series of a monthly webinar talking about things like uh, our atheist voter initiative and 
and bird dogging. And we've talked about, um, Jeff's done a couple talks for us on different legal issues like graduations and prayer. Of course, <laughs> we did that in the spring. Now there's no graduations this year, but it'll still be an evergreen resource for next year. <laughs> um, and then of course, Allison has done a couple trainings on our legislative work and on, um, uh, on the survey. So we've, we have a bunch of resources. I'm also gonna drop that link into the chat because they are recorded and you can go and check them out whenever you would like to. This will also be, I did see in the Q&A, somebody was asking if we're recording this. This will be recorded and then this link will end up in this go to Sage place as well. Um, so that's one of the things we're really working on is, is getting more resources out to our folks. Um, and then as Nick mentioned, we have this wonderful assortment of assistant and state directors who are our volunteer feet on the ground in the communities where you live. And they do a fantastic job of being out there and representing us. And they do things like they go and testify on different bills that Allison and her team are tracking and working on. And they help us to take our action alerts and get them out to groups and post them all across the internet. If you took our secular survey, chances are one of our state directors took that information and posted it somewhere that you happen to see it. And, uh, and you took that survey of 34,000 people, right? Um, so some of the other things they're doing is there are face in the local press. So if we have a local issue, um, obviously right now there's a lot of local news about churches holding meetings and things like that. So there, there are local folks who are talking to the press, who are writing letters to the editor, who are doing op-eds on their local community in, in media. Uh, on top of that, both of our, our directors and our affiliates are doing a lot of amazing community service work right now. We have, um, I'm shout out a couple of them that I know off the top of my head. We have the Atheist Community of Lubbock does a no strings attached event and they're doing neighbors helping neighbors and they're collecting groceries and sending out um, volunteers with grocery packs for, for their neighbors in need. We have uh, Atheist Community of Polk County is making masks. So is Oklahoma Atheist. Oklahoma Atheist has also uh, been distributing hand sanitizer, water, and bug spray packages to their homeless population. And then we have Northern Indiana Atheist who is doing, they bottled something insane, like they handmade and then bottled. I think they're up to like 12 gallons of hand sanitizer and they are then putting that in a package of, of materials, um, hygiene materials and some snacks and things like that and distributing that to their homeless population. So we have a lot of really great people out there doing really great things. I'm gonna go get my cat so I don't feel left out. Um, <laughs> so that's uh, for future stuff this year. What we're looking forward to doing is adding more groups and taking on more state directors and offering more resources to folks. Um, and one of the questions that's in that survey that's gonna pop up is what would you like to see us do more trainings on, more webinars on? Maybe it's uh, you know nonprofit development, maybe it's more legal questions, whatever it is. We have staff for that, and if we don't, we can connect with outside resources and have folks come in and give you the information that you need. So with that, I'm gonna turn it back over to Debbie. Cool. Um, yeah, I wanted to mention just a couple other future things we're doing related to field in general. Um, as I mentioned, building further our affiliate network, but also building our list of coalition partners and local organizations that we can work with across the country is one of our goals. Um, we are also, in a lot of the things that we're doing here, the goal is to build our contact lists with organizations, to build our membership, to build our constituent lists, uh, to build coalition partners, everything like that, not just for action alerts as Allison talked about, and not just because you know membership is great and we need that kind of thing to support any kind of organization, any nonprofit, any work. But just as is the case for election campaigns and anything, a movement like ours needs to build local power and have a strong ground game to make change. We can't always do it at the federal level. A lot of this happens at the state and local level. Some of this happens on the personal level. And more recently, <laughs> even more of this needs to happen online. And so we're paying close attention to things like election campaigns, how things have changed just in the last six weeks to see how we need to operate differently in this current moment 
considering the stay-at-home orders, the threat of the pandemic, what the next six months are going to look like. And that's one of the biggest challenges we're facing is, you know, not just the new threats from the administration, but the new ways that we have to operate in order to accomplish these goals and make sure we have good connections with people wherever they are. Fortunately, the online atheist community is pretty strong too. And so making connections better there, um, doing better work to get our action alerts out and getting the, the word out about the different things we're doing is one of our big goals. And uh, back to Nick. Thanks everybody. Um, so I, I just wanted to uh, just give a general round of applause without clapping because I don't wanna blow up a microphone here uh, to all the work that um, Sam and Debbie and Allison and Jeff and all of our uh, really talented staff do. Um, I think many of you uh, know uh, the staff that we have. We have uh, fewer than a dozen staff uh, doing all of this work uh, and they really uh, work their butts off, um, especially at a time when uh, things are very uncertain. And so I just wanted to uh, give them a shout out and really thank them, uh, but also thank our volunteers. Uh, they really are the backbone of everything that we do and multiply uh, our ability to get work done. And so for all of you state directors, all of you group leaders, all of you who have just taken action um, on our um, action alerts, thank you for everything that you've done. Um, I wanted to give you a, a bit of a, a summary of some of our goals for the upcoming year, uh, but also obviously speak about uh, the last few weeks in particular, um, and just kind of where things stand uh, as a result of this ongoing uncertainty from the coronavirus uh, crisis. Um, as a result of uh, postponing our national convention, um, obviously we're missing an opportunity to connect with all of you. Uh, we're missing an opportunity to do training, uh, to present uh, really fantastic speakers who have a lot to say about what's happening in the world right now and who have information to share with you. Um, one of the things that we're doing is uh, producing a series of uh, web uh, speaker series, uh, web speaker series, excuse me. Um, so that you can hear from people who have timely information to share uh, that they would have been able to share at our conference uh, and then would have been up online, uh, but because there is no conference, uh, we want to make sure that you can still hear from them. Um, so expect to see that coming in the summer. Uh, those will be conversations, uh, not just sort of talking at you, but um, something similar to this perhaps um, streamed on uh, YouTube or on Facebook Live or on a separate platform. And we'll have more details to share uh, about that as we finalize our plans. Um, there is certainly an aspect of uh, financial uh, concern that we have about um, not having our largest event each year, uh, but I do want to assure everyone that um, American Atheists uh, is in a, a really good, really strong position financially, but given the uncertainty of the moment, uh, I certainly hope that everybody who is on this call uh, will uh, recognize the important work that's happening and in fact the crucial work that's happening during the government response to this crisis and acknowledge and, and recognize that um, our work has never been more important and if you have not yet renewed your membership for this year please do um, and if you are uh, in a position to do so um, we hope that you'll uh, become a sustaining member uh, with American Atheists which means making a smaller monthly contribution uh, rather than just donating once per year and spread out your giving throughout the year to allow us to more effectively budget uh, and prioritize and plan uh, for what's going to happen. Um, if uh, we, we are looking at rolling out uh, some, some new ways to, uh, to give in that way, um, lowering the cost of the barrier of entry uh, and also increasing some of the uh, benefits that come with that, including receiving the paper magazine and uh, other uh, benefits associated with monthly uh, support because it is so important to us at a time when there's so much uncertainty, knowing that we can count on uh, the mem members of American Atheists uh, to stand with us um, uh, with, you know, three, five, ten dollars a month. Uh, it really makes a huge difference. Uh, we'll be rolling out that program in the next uh, in the next week or so um, and making it easier to join that. Uh, there is a way to do that on our website currently as well, uh, but we will be sending more information uh, about becoming a monthly member shortly. Um, I'd like to ask uh, everyone if you, uh, you know, would be, if that's something you're interested in, we have a poll question now and we will send more information to those who uh, would like to. So Sam, if you can throw that poll up on the screen, I would appreciate it. Maybe. <laughs> oh, 
Maybe. Nope. I think it ended up in the survey. So that will be in the survey. When That'll be in the survey. Closes. <laughs> Great. So that's fine. <laughs> so at the end of the webinar, please stick around and answer that survey question um, because it is a, a really crucial way for us to, um, again, plan for what's happening because, you know, again, amidst all this uncertainty, uh, we want you to know that we're not going anywhere, uh, but we do rely on the support of thousands and thousands of people chipping in a little bit each month uh, to help us um, do the work that we do. Um, our goals for this year are to continue to increase our membership engagement um, by uh, producing more high quality content um, that is uh, topical, that is informative, uh, and that is impactful um, and is relevant to what is happening in communities all across this country. Um, so again, keep an eye out for uh, more uh, webinar series, uh, more conversations, more presentations, and more trainings, uh, but also resources on our website uh, that will be accessible to anybody uh, who needs some help um, accomplishing work um, in your local community, in fighting back against Christian nationalism in your state, uh, and protecting uh, the rights of atheists. Uh, beyond that, one of our um, one of the the things that we've done over the last year that's really paying dividends now is expanding our reach and our reputation in the media, um, making sure that the media sees us as experts and understands that we bring a unique perspective to policy debates, um, not just at the national level, but in state and local politics. Um, just to highlight a few stories um, that we have worked on over the course of the last six months or so. Um, just uh, the eight largest stories um, that we worked with members of the media on, including a piece with NPR about the Paycheck Protection Program that Allison worked on with uh, Tom Jelton from NPR, was the single most uh, highly engaged story on NPR social media platforms uh, when it came out. And that was the story about how uh, churches would, would be eligible for Paycheck Protection Program money. And we were one of the first organizations to call that out to urge uh, the government to not do that. Uh, and we are um, coordinating responses to that as well. Um, Associated Press pieces about faith-based programs in the workplace um, ended up in outlets, uh, more than 7,000 outlets because of the AP's uh, wire service, uh, reaching more than 100 million people. Um, work that we've done even on the international level, commenting on the actions of the Trump administration, particularly at the State Department and Mike Pompeo, <clears throat> Uh, reached an estimated 50 million people, and uh, we've been working with Vox.com on a number of policy-related bills, both on religious exemptions to healthcare, uh, LGBTQ rights, and the exemptions, religious exemptions being pushed uh, in those bills, and uh, our work at the state level is gaining traction not just on uh, national press, but in countless local outlets. And so uh, that's uh, thanks in large part to our communications director, uh, Tom Vandenberg. And so I wanna thank him for all of his hard work, uh, but also the work of our uh, policy, legal and field team who keep an eye on this stuff and make sure that we're able to comment when uh, this sort of thing comes up as it constantly does. Um, pivoting from our uh, or talk, sticking with uh, the field and community side of things, we're gonna continue to invest in communities um, it is the uh, one of the largest changes in our budget over the previous years have been a transition away from uh, some of our uh, other programs and a, a massive investment in our field program, including hiring Sam um, and, and having a full-time field director position. Uh, that started uh, three years ago with Jim Helton, and Sam has been with us now for almost a year, right? Yeah, um, and is doing a really fantastic job there. Um, we are also um, going to be launching a new website uh, with more uh, with more content, again, that is more topical, uh, that is more informative, uh, and that is more shareable uh, for folks uh, in the uh, on online, uh, in the online spaces, especially right now. Um, I wanted to address some questions that we've had about our 2021 convention as well. Um, as uh, some of Sam and Debbie have mentioned, uh, the convention has been postponed until next year. Uh, meaning that it will be in the same venue, the same city, and the same lunar weekend, I suppose. Uh, it will be Easter weekend, once again, uh, April 1st to the 4th, uh, in Phoenix at the um, Hyatt Regency downtown. Uh, it's right by the Convention Center in Phoenix. We are really looking forward to 
uh, sharing the outstanding activism uh, that has been done by the folks in Arizona, uh, by working uh, in coalition with a, a number of groups on the ground uh, and continuing to build relationships in the region. Um, there's just so much that's happening in Arizona. It is really a focal point of um, you know, Christian nationalism and bad bills and, uh, just you know, justified by religion um, that we have to fight back against. It's also the headquarters of groups uh, of the group Alliance Defending Freedom. Uh, and it's a, the site where we did a billboard campaign that exposed the fact that they had received more than a million dollars in taxpayer funds through a license plate program uh, in just under, uh, I believe it was seven years. Um, um, and with that, um, just a few little final things I'll just mention again, we really do rely on the support of our members. Um, and so if you've not yet renewed your membership, uh, you can just go to atheist.org slash give, and that will take you to a donate page and you can get your membership renewed. Uh, as I mentioned, we will have more information about our sustaining member program. So keep an eye out for that in your inbox and please uh, answer that survey question. Um, Allison mentioned signing up for action alerts um, and some folks have asked in the chat how to get more involved in our work. Uh, that's certainly the best starting point is to go to atheist.org slash act. Uh, that's atheist.org slash ACT and sign up for our action alerts. And finally, um, I know that a lot of folks are doing uh, an awful lot of uh, online shopping for the basics. And if you're using Amazon, um, I would suggest also visiting atheists.org slash smile and designating American Atheists as your um, uh, Amazon Smile charity. And Amazon will donate a portion of all of the orders that you place on its platform to American Atheists. And uh, we really do appreciate that as well. So. Um, with that, um, we will certainly take some questions. Um, I know that we have uh, we have a few that have, more than a few, a lot <laughs> that have come in. Uh, and so I'll start with just a couple here, um, uh, starting with the questions about the conference. Obviously, we were very disappointed. Um, this is answering Jules uh, in Ohio's question about canceling or postponing the conference. Yeah, we were we were certainly disappointed to have to postpone it. Um, and I think that the, the main thing that we look forward to in the year that's sort of a exhausting, but at the same time, re recharging, rejuvenating event is seeing all of you at our conference and getting to interact with you, uh, getting to, you know, play Cards Against Humanity or other board games with you, just hang out in the uh, social spaces of the hotel with you, um, answer your questions, get to know you better. Um, and it's something that so many of our volunteers and activists tell us is a, a, an important part of their year, something they really look forward to, not just because of the speakers and the content, but the social interaction. And so it's really important for us to um, acknowledge that we're missing that this year um, and do everything we can to put together uh, just a kick-ass conference for you next year. And so you can learn more about that and keep an eye out for more information uh, at convention.atheists.org or atheist.org slash convention, either on work, uh, but it will be at the Hyatt Regency in Phoenix next Easter, uh, Easter weekend. Um, there was a question about um, uh, being new to the cause and how you can get more involved um, from Tammy. And uh, Sam, would you like to field that one? Sure thing, but I also wanna point out that people wanna know the names of your cats. It's very important information as well. <laughs> well, we'll we'll close with that because we want to we don't want to give them the, the key information now because they'll just leave. Uh, so at we least want a to half uh, dozen you have times. To, <laughs> right. Yeah. You got to stick around to the end to the to first get, way to, to get, get involved get is adopt a cat, and then yeah. after that. Um, so if you want to get involved, there's a couple ways to do that. The first one, obviously, is to go to our website. Um, Nick mentioned that we're in the middle of changing around some things. Uh, very shortly, there should be a way to sign up for our emails, which will get you on our email list. Since you are in this event and signed up for this event, you will start getting some emails from me about future webinars and activities and things that we're doing, like Secular Week of Action and Atheist Voter and things like that. Um, on top of that, if you go to our website and look up our affiliates and find a group that is near you. And then if there's not a group near you and you wanna shoot me an email at smcguire at atheist.org and I'll put that into the chat as well, then we can help you start an affiliate group um, wherever it is you live. 
And then if you are just so excited about all of that and you just love our action alerts and you want to get even more involved, then you would go and find our state director page and see if there's a state director in your state or in your town. And if there is not, then you would fill out the form there and we can talk about having you come and volunteer with our excellent team. Great, thanks so much, Sam. Um, the, another question that I think is really topical that I will um, hand off uh, to Allison and maybe bring in Jeff um, on is a question about the courts uh, on the legal front. How optimistic are we considering the number of uh, federal judicial appointments from uh, Christian nationalist activists uh, and the work of uh, the Attorney General, Attorney General William Barr? Uh, so, Allison, do you want to start there, and maybe Jeff can hop in as well. Sure, I'm happy from, to. It's from Todd Sanders. I'm sorry. I'm happy to. So, yes, the courts are scary right now. I'll be, I'll be frank. It's a challenging time, and they're getting worse. Um, you know, but it's also important to keep in mind that although the people that Trump's appointing um, as judges, they're not by any stretch ideal. Many of them are not. Many of them are pretty standard like judges that would be appointed by any sort of Republican president. So keep that in mind. They're not, as a whole, different than other judges. There's only, I would say, a smaller percentage that are like ideologues, and there definitely are some, like ones that the American Bar Association has rated unqualified, that have never been in court, and yet are now in charge of court cases. That's, but that is atypical. But that is scary because those people are now going to be in charge of like writing cases that will decide major points of law. And so uh, I'm not exactly sure what the question was, but the, yes, it's a, it's a challenging time in the courts. I feel like there has to be, um, you know, the most Trump can turn over in this uh, during his first term is about one fourth of the bench, the total bench. So if you consider with that in mind, even if he does a whole fourth of the bench, and let's say that, you know, half of those are extreme ideologues, which I think is probably a high guess. And we're only talking about one, one in eight judges, right? Which is still enough to impact the law, but it does not mean that we can't get a fair shake in the courts. And I think we have to fight at every level and we're going to continue to do that. Um, so of course it's a problem. And I feel like over time, you know, we'll definitely see the ramifications, but we also have to keep fighting at every level. We can't just give up. Jeff, was there anything you wanted to add on that? Um, I, I would just uh, say, you know, that that concern is, as Allison indicated, not unfounded. Um, I think that um, the the best thing that we all can do if we're concerned about control of the judiciary going to people who are not in favor of the separation of church and state is um, to vote uh, in November. You got to vote in November. Um, I expect that everyone listening to this call right now, uh, just by virtue of the fact that you are this involved, probably we're going to be voting no matter what. Um, and, and I would also say that regardless of who the judge is sitting on the bench, uh, we have to present the best arguments possible. Um, as Allison said, we can't just, you know, sit down and wait until there's judges that are more favorable. Um, there, there is something to be said for trying to convince the judge who's sitting in front of you. And also try, in doing so, you um, may convince uh, a judge who takes a similar case next year or, or, or 20 years from now, you know. Um, so, we take our judges as they come and uh, uh, present the best argument to them and 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 tailor their arguments also uh, hopefully in a way that uh, uh, that will um, speak to the judge's perspective to the extent that that's possible that we know the judge's perspective um, ideally you should be totally unaware of what the judge thinks they shouldn't be out well shouldn't be out talking about, <laughs> about their um, views on particular causes of action and that kind of thing, but uh, 
yeah, I've, I've said more than my piece, so <laughs> I'll hand it back. Actually, I just want to add one other part. Um, this is one of the reasons that American Atheists is shifting towards using innovative approaches. Like, for example, Jeff talked about the case against uh, Jason Rapert in Arkansas, which is a case where we're using the, fir the free speech portions of the First Amendment to defend the rights of atheists, not just the Establishment Clause portion. And I think we're going to have to use those sorts of innovative approaches. And we've really sort of been trying to innovate and be a leader where we can to develop the law not just in one particular you know, part of the Constitution, but more broadly to protect civil rights, protect the separation of religion and government, and protect atheists, the civil rights of atheists. So I think that's one side. And also, this whole conversation has inspired me. I really feel like we need an action or to, on behalf of our membership to the Senate, your senators, saying, hey, please nominate fair judges that uphold the Constitution. So I think that's something we'll look into putting forth um, next week after we release the report because we're not going to do it this week. Anyway, that's <laughs> I think that's a, that's a really smart idea. Yeah, there's a little bit going on over the course of the next week. And yeah, uh, thank you both uh, so much for, uh, for talking about that. It is a really important thing that we do think about is how to approach the legal work that needs to be done uh, and be smart about where we spend our uh, limited resources in, in, in court cases. Um, so uh, it is something we think about a lot. Um, we had some questions about coalition work. Um, should we partner with uh, religious groups um, to make sure that, uh, that that do care about protecting the separation of religion from government, uh, other sort of marginalized religious groups, um, having them speak at our conferences, partnering with them, um, and, and also working in, in the local level um, with uh, different groups, maybe groups of slightly different, differing opinions, as long as we find some common ground. Um, Debbie, do you want to start with that, and then maybe Sam can come in on that as well? The difficult thing about answering this question is keeping the answer short. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> We're for yes, it. You <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that's been a, a really interesting shift over the last couple decades in the in organized atheism is an increased willingness in working with different religious organizations to advance our cause. We're not a huge community or movement. So if we want to succeed at a lot of our advocacy work and our policy work, at just changing hearts and minds, we need to be able to work with different kinds of people. And one of the best places that we've done that is with the uh, Blitz Watch Coalition, where we have formally uh, created coalition relationships with things like Interfaith Alliance, uh, non-religious but non-atheist groups like the National LGBTQ Task Force have joined. Uh, what is the, the Jewish group called? I forget. But also things like uh, the Religious Coalition for Reproductive Choice has joined a coalition run by American atheists because they also are concerned about Christian nationalists and the effect that they have on the government. We, uh, four of us went actually from the New Jersey headquarters building office to an event in New York City back in January that was run by the um, Reverend Dr. <laughs> Reverend Dr. William Barber's group, um, which is a very Christian group and uses very Christian language. And it was about how to fight Christian nationalism. So there we were in a room with very Christian people who were also very concerned about the kind of theocratic conservative perspective that's advanced by Christian nationalists in our government. And I would not think in the years that I've worked in this movement that, you know, here is a ripe space for us to find friends to join the fight against this harmful force. But there we were <laughs> talking to reverend doctors and whatnot about the threat from Christian nationalists and thinking of ways that we can honestly work together. And, you know, they have a big voice. They're reaching people that we're certainly not reaching when it comes to advancing on these different issues, you know, these are the kinds of relationships that we need to build to, to actually succeed at this. Turn over to Sam. Sorry. In the Q&A over here. Um, yeah, so there's a couple different questions about that. And I think that one of the things that Debbie and I have been talking about in um, the next year is really reaching out to our local people on the ground and finding, so we have Blitzwatch, which is a national coalition of organizations that are 
watching Project Blitz. And those are all national organizations who we are aligned with. But it, we really want to build that at a state level, right? So I live in Maryland. So I want to know who the Maryland ACLU is. I want to know who the Maryland Planned Parenthood person is. I want to know who it is that I can contact and reach out to from PFLAG and from the other groups that we're working with. And so we're going to really be trying to make that process a little bit more robust and, and rely on all of the folks that we have across the country to help us with those contacts. And um, so, you know, if you see something come out and we're looking for some contacts uh, in your state or in your town or in your city, that's, that's probably what we're looking for is so that if we have something going on, um, like a bill in Maryland that was a conversion therapy bill that I went and testified on, right? And so while I was there waiting to testify, I got to meet all these folks from ACLU and from the local LGBTQ community groups and, and a bunch of other folks. And so now if we're looking to do something like our Patient Right to Know Act in Maryland, we can reach back out to those groups and be able to say, hey, remember when we worked on this together? Now American Atheist is working on this issue and we want to be able to tap those relationships as much as we can. Um, so that's one of the things we're really working on at a state level. Great, thank you, Sam. Mm -hmm. um, we've had a few questions. Uh, we had a question come in from email um, and it sort of ties in with a question from Jacqueline um, about stopping the administration from directly supporting ev the ev evangelical movement with taxpayer funds. Uh, and the question that came in from, through the email was about the work that we've done to highlight the religious organizations receiving taxpayer money um, through this Paycheck Protection Program, but also through other avenues. Um, and the question was, um, has anyone tracked exactly where that money is going? And uh, is there anything we can do to block uh, those disbursements? Um, and the answer to that, I'll speak for a moment and then I'll turn it over to Allison. Uh, the answer there is uh, we are certainly keeping an eye on this. Uh, we are keeping an eye on it both at the federal government, uh, the federal level, but also at the state level. Um, but it is something that we all have to uh, work in partnership with our allies at the Freedom from Religion Foundation and the American Humanist Association and the Center for Inquiry and the Secular Coalition for America. There isn't a, a one-shot answer to this. It's not as simple as, um, well, churches are getting Paycheck Protection Program money, uh, someone should sue them uh, or should sue the government to stop it. Um, some of the challenges are on standing. Uh, how do we bring that case? Uh, and there's just, it, there's so many moving parts to that that um, we have to approach it in a comprehensive way that doesn't just include, include litigation, but also includes edu educating uh, members of the administration, uh, professional staff at these agencies, um, educating members of Congress, uh, working with uh, groups like the Congressional Free Thought Caucus, uh, which is led by the only openly atheist, agnostic-ish, <laughs> I don't know, uh, his, per his personal uh, identifier, but he says he does not believe in God, so we'll go with that. Uh, Jared Huffman, who is the co-chair of the Free Thought Caucus, working with them to educate members of Congress and to raise these issues, uh, but also educate um, governors and you know all levels of government so that they know what is and is not required uh, by the Constitution um, as far as implementing these sort of um, exemptions to the stay-at-home orders or you know the, the Paycheck Protection Program or what, what the Supreme Court precedent actually says because we can't trust, uh, unfortunately, the Department of Justice uh, to be an honest arbiter of what the state of the law is. Uh, because William Barr likes to just lie and make things up about what the law requires uh, as it relates to uh, religious freedom. Um, Allison, is there anything else that you wanted to add in there? Yeah, just a couple things. Um, I, I, I feel like we've done a lot of great work to highlight this issue for Congress and also for the Small Business Administration. We're right in the middle of a comment period. So the, after the Congress passed their CARES Act, which basically put money into the special fund, the Paycheck Protection Program, they, the Small Business Administration, or SBA, created some emergency rules that then basically are called interim final rules. And then we have 30 days for the public to submit comments talking about why they are bad, basically. And so we um, last week launched an action alert out to get as many people to write comments in from members of the public about what, why this is problematic, why you know that they should not be funding churches as possible. 
and so that's still going going to be ongoing. It's we're closing the campaign on May 15th. So a really great way. We we want to get as many folks to write as possible to raise awareness here. Another thing we're doing though is partnering with a lot of different organizations, including FFRF and a lot of like non-secular groups um, that are have overlapping interests to put together like a series of comments coming from different organizations. So they're not just hearing from the secular groups, they're hearing from all types of they're going to be hearing from all different types of groups before the deadline. Um, other groups involved, for example, are um, some of the other ones, I'm sorry. Uh, there was the National Center for Transgender Equality was one. There was, um, and they were concerned about a few different aspects having to do with um, diversion programs because they set up it, they set up in a way that conflicts with the law around diversion programs. And then there was another situation with um, um, uh, several groups in New York were concerned how certain types of businesses are being excluded because they might involve, for example, sale of materials that are um, Prurient or you know involve sexually explicit materials, and so they are unfairly being excluded from. So it's not just this issue. There's lots of different types of organizations that have issues with how SBA is sort of ramming this through and giving out the money and not having proper oversight. And the point is, by working together with different orgs, we're able to raise awareness and broaden out the spectrum of groups that are opposing it. Um, so that's one way we're doing it. And if this moves forward, I think at every time this comes up in Congress and they try to allocate more money, we have to be right there and say, hey, this is not appropriate. You need to. Um, fix the situation. You need to make sure the money is not going to go to churches. Uh, and, you know, it's going to be a while before the government starts forgiving the money. Um, I mean, we don't we don't actually know at this stage what money is going out the door. I don't think anybody knows. It's really kind of, um, I don't know, it's not well, well, not well organized <laughs> at the moment. They're just trying to get the money out the door and not really pay attention to where it's going. So it's going to be a while before any of that actually gets forgiven. So we do have some time to hopefully affect the state of the law. But uh, we are watching closely and looking for ways where we can engage uh, other, other avenues, perhaps litigation if possible. Great. Um, we have a question about, uh, let me see here. Um, <laughs> thank you, Neil Polzin, who left uh, from Camp Quest and Secular Student Alliance formerly. Uh, <laughs> uh, we did have a question about um, additional involvement in uh, local groups, including providing grants, uh, supporting uh, supporting local events and things like that uh, from, um, uh, yeah. Uh, and so, yeah, I want to uh, reassure, Evan, thank you. It, the question went away as I was like reading it. <laughs> I was like, who asked that? Wait, uh, Evan um, asked about that. And so, yes, um, we uh, certainly want to invest heavily in our local groups. Um, the, the work that we've do, that we've been doing around the, uh, the the reality check report in the U.S. Secular Survey is a resource. The, the resources that we're developing for best practices for running groups is a resource. Uh, but sometimes we know that sometimes the best way to uh, support the work that groups are doing is to uh, give them the money to uh, try something themselves and to support the work that they're doing directly. Um, and so that's something that is part of the agenda and something we'll continue to do. Um, other things that we're working on as far as resources for local groups are, uh, would be speaker series, um, uh, speakers bureau, um, subsidizing and uh, directly funding speakers coming to local groups. Um, in, it's actually relatively inexpensive right now since uh, we're uh, not actually meeting in person, so we can do just video conferencing, uh, but highlighting speakers that are of particular interest um, in the in the community at the moment uh, and that have something really topical to share in the moment uh, and so that's that's something that's very high on our agenda to increase engagement and to make sure that groups are able to uh, access high quality speakers but also high quality programming that meets the needs of uh, folks in their community and that that is a part of the secular of the survey and the report is what do community groups want what do people report needing from their local groups and that's one of the reasons we want to share that with you if you are a group leader so you know how to program and you know what people are saying that they want and need. Uh, Sam, was there anything you wanted to add on that? It's sort of in your wheelhouse there. Yeah, so I mean, one of the things that we have talked about is revamping our affiliate and local partner program and making sort of another affiliate is a pretty low bar. You're a group, you want to affiliate, that means it will send you some goodies, we'll give you some access to stuff, we'll make sure you know about trainings. Um, things like that, but we we're talking about revamping our local partner um, sort of 
program to give folks some extra resources that they can access on top of that. Um, Evan's question specifically was about grants. We don't really do that right now. We do do some things like uh, if you have a group, if you're gonna go, so like in Northern Indiana, we give, uh, we pay for a pride table there so that they can go and do a big tabling event and they have all of their affiliate groups in all of Indiana go to that event. And so they have volunteers from all over the state and they get to meet with people from all over the state. And so we subsidize that for them. So there are some things that we do do. Um, if there's something that you want or need, I would just reach out to me or Debbie or Nick, and it's something we can definitely talk about. Absolutely. Um, we're running, a, we're a little about five minutes over, but we have just a couple questions that I think we can run through quickly here. Um, we have a question uh, from Ben about uh, working, just joining American Atheists, thank you for all you do. Uh, what can we do or how do we work with like-minded organizations? Um, one of the things that we do is work in partnership. Um, I, I mentioned this a little bit about the coalitions that we've built. If you're, if you're looking for a place to get involved, some other groups to be a part of, um, a, a great place to start would be uh, on our Blitzwatch Coalition. There's some, a collection of really fantastic groups there uh, that you know, are groups that we work very closely with on this one particular project. And it is certainly one of the biggest things that we're dealing with right now is the ascendancy of Christian nationalism in our policy making. And so you can uh, learn a little bit more about that at blitzwatch.org. Um, and that will be uh, just, about, I don't know, about three quarters of the way down the page, there's a list of some really fantastic groups that you can um, be a part of, that you can work with, that we work with, obviously. Um, other coalitions that we work, we work with regularly um, include um, just a, a giant coalition called the Leadership Conference on uh, Civil and Human Rights. Um, we are a member of that. Uh, it's made up of a number of the nation's largest, um, most effective uh, civil and human rights groups, as the name implies, uh, including groups like the ACLU, uh, but also uh, us, uh, reproductive choice groups, uh, women's uh, groups in general, um, uh, the NAACP is a member, um, uh, the, uh, just the list kind of just goes on and on and on. I mean, I think there's hundreds of members in the leadership conference um, and they have working groups on dozens of issues. Um, the ones that we primarily focus on are things like education and healthcare because that's where um, that's where religious exemptions really uh, intersect with a lot of that work. Uh, and so um, that's a really good place to start as well. And certainly, you know, we have some really valuable and um, outstanding allies right here within our own secular community. Um, and I would certainly start with groups like the Secular Student Alliance and uh, Recovering from Religion and uh, the Secular Coalition for America and uh, just uh, Foundation Beyond Belief as well, Camp Quest. Um, there are so many groups in this community that deserve your support and deserve your activism, um, but also the lar larger groups that work with us on the national level on policy issues and on group issues like the American Humanist Association, like the Center for Inquiry, uh, like Freedom From Religion Foundation. Um, they're all really invaluable partners and I can't uh, tell you how much their partnership means to us uh, and uh, the, the relationship that we have with all of them to actually get things done has never been closer. Um, I, I know that our litigators and our policy staff meet regularly to talk about strategy, to talk about what's coming up. Uh, we don't operate in a vacuum and we don't, uh, we, we can't just go do our own thing. Uh, we have to work together if we're going to win these battles. And so it's uh, crucial that we're talking and I'm really proud of the fact that um, American atheists can take a leadership role in building those relationships and sustaining those relationships, um, not just within the community, but uh, with people outside the community. Um, let's see here. There was a question. Is there any, anything else, Elson, that you wanted to add there, Debbie? Those yeah, are... I think you've covered a lot of it. I mean, we, we were involved in a lot of different coalitions focused on different topic areas, like, for example, sex education or reproductive health and uh, family planning um, are two examples. Um, you know, we do, we, ha we, we organize a lot of uh, work uh, cross partner work like for example we run a monthly meeting for national organizations that do state level advocacy work which which we run for especially focused on secular issues so we bring together all across our movement and other and other orgs too people that really want to focus on state level work um, dealing with with um, you know advocacy on secular issues so church state mostly um, 
and so that's an that's example of a coalition that we formed. But there's several others, um, and we're, we're pretty engaged, and more so, more and more, we're trying to work very closely with other organizations that were tied in. And that way, you know, when people send around, um, inform each other of events, we, we're, we have a seat at the table when, when people are developing, you know, new, um, like sort of, for example, statutory language, and they're inviting people to different campaigns. Uh, we always try to be involved if it's relevant to our interests, because that, that makes a difference. The more people see that we're interested and are able to work on these issues, the more likely to, they are to reach out to us and partner with us. So we try to be very active and engaged. Yeah. Yep. Um, we had a question, and this is topical as well, um, about sort of international issues. Uh, what do we do on international issues? Um, there was a, a story that just broke uh, earlier today about uh, a member of our global secular humanist atheist community being arrested uh, for blasphemy. Um, we are a member of Humanists International, which was formerly known as the uh, IHEU, the International Humanist and Ethical Union, um, which uh, is the, the largest coalition of uh, international groups that includes uh, Humanists UK, uh, as well as the large uh, humanist groups, um, the national humanist groups in uh, places like Norway and Germany and the Netherlands, uh, but also many of the large secular organizations here in the US. Um, and so we defer a lot to their judgment uh, because our expertise is primarily in state and national policy um, as well as community work. Uh, we are not experts on international and foreign policy. Um, however, we do work very closely with them on any activity that's happening, uh, especially when the United States government is involved. Um, and so as an example of that, um, American Atheist was invited and I attended a, a ministerial, uh, which is uh, has nothing to do with uh, ministers of the faith, but rather government ministers. Um, it's an international meeting of, uh, I think there were close to a thousand people there uh, that took place at the State Department uh, in Washington, D.C. over the summer. Uh, that's the first time American Atheists has ever been invited to that. Um, and this was an opportunity for us to meet with uh, members of the State Department, uh, professionals working in the Office of International Religious Freedom, uh, but also political appointees like Sam Brownback, um, and uh, make sure that our voices were heard and that our agenda was uh, understood uh, at, at this event. Um, you know, despite <laughs> despite the, pro the challenges of working with Sam Brown back in Mike Pompeo, um, there is certainly uh, overlap and opportunity for collaboration on persecution, um, especially in uh, countries where blasphemy is a crime, where people are still being arrested, jailed, killed for blasphemy. Um, particularly in Muslim majority countries where, uh, you know, insulting the prophet Muhammad uh, is a capital offense in, in some cases. Um, you know, working closely with uh, groups that um, are sometimes religious groups because, and uh, mainly Christian groups that oppose uh, that type of uh, policy at the international level because Christians are certainly persecuted just as, as much as atheists in these countries. Uh, and so we want to, uh, find partnerships and find ways to collaborate there. And it's a very fruitful relationship because as with many other coalition uh, activities, we can hopefully find common ground down the road uh, on issues that can sort of, you know, edge in a little bit. And so we do have, uh, we've, we've worked with uh, folks like Senator Langford, who is one of the most conservative and religious members of the Senate, uh, but cares very deeply about international religious freedom. And so it allows us to work in collaboration with Center for Inquiry and American Humanist Association um, to and FFRF to uh, advance religious freedom internationally because we do care about real religious freedom. Um, you know, we would not, I think I speak for the majority of people here, I hope, um, we would not support the sort of um, government system that stifles religious freedom and implements a mandatory um, sort of atheist regime on folks, uh, we we do value the First Amendment. We do value freedom of expression and freedom of tr uh, freedom of uh, uh, the Establishment Clause, as well as the Free Exercise Clause. Um, we do think people should be able to exercise their religion as long as it's not harming people, um, and that's the limit that uh, we're running into now. Is uh, the exercise of religion in the United States is often harming people, um, and we have to push back on that. But we do respect the right of people to believe. Uh, what they want to believe, um, advocate for our position, advocate as strongly as we can for um, living a good life as an atheist and what it means to be an atheist and show 
that as a positive example, um, but we wouldn't support taking away people's rights uh, to uh, to believe um, as uh, you know uh, something that happens in China with the persecution of uh, Uyghur Muslims, for example, or uh, things that happen in um, in the Soviet Union, for example. We wouldn't support something like that. And so it's it's challenging, and, and people uh, it, it allows us to um, to play a role and take part in things in a way that is sometimes surprising to members of Congress, which is helpful for us when we're uh, working to build coalition and build relationships. So. Uh, did anyone else have anything to add in that area? Okay. Um, let's see here, just a couple questions about some cases and then we'll, I think, wrap it up with some closing stuff. Um, Bonnie in Bonnie Cleveland asked, Jeff, are there, uh, do you have a sense of the kinds of events we should look for so we can advance the law proactively rather than only reacting to Christian nationalism? Um, and then uh, a question about uh, religious monuments on public property. Um, I'll start with the monuments on public property and then you can answer Bonnie's question maybe. Um, the monuments question is, is difficult because of the state of the law. And so we're um, keeping an eye on these, but uh, it's, it's challenging given the realities of the decision in the Bladensburg Cross case, uh, the American Legion versus American Human Association case, um, and some of the other cases that have come out of that. Um, it's something we're going to continue monitoring, but we think we can be um, more effective in the political arena um, on those issues, quite frankly, than necessarily just tackling those through the courts. Uh, we want to win. We don't want to make bad law. And we want, but we do want to um, make sure we're, we're keeping an eye on these sorts of things. And there are still limits. You can't just erect a giant cross tomorrow. Um, and hopefully that doesn't happen. And if it does, we'll <laughs> certainly weigh in on it. Um, but at the same time, some of these more ex longer existing crosses uh, and religious monuments um, present a challenge to us currently. Um, and so we need to, and we are working on ways to tackle those in a different way that doesn't necessarily involve a complicated and challenging uh, federal judicial system. Uh, and so Jeff, uh, if you wanna tag on that and answer Bonnie's question perhaps, or if you have anything to add there. Yeah, yeah. Um, I, I don't have much to add on displays. Uh, unfortunately, you know, the, um, the, as Nick said, the state of the law is bad right now. Um, and, uh, we are taking what steps we can to challenge displays, but we do want to avoid at all costs um, making the state of the law worse, which is actually a nice segue into Bonnie's question. Um, and uh, Bonnie, that's an excellent question. The problem is that there is no concise answer I can give you. Um, part of what we are trying to do is um, plot a strategy that is, um, uh, takes into account the state of the law and the differences in the state of the law, depending on where you are in the country. Um, as a result, there are, it, it may be, for instance, easier to take a particular case in Oregon than it would be in Texas. Um, and at the same time, it may be uh, an easier lift from a legal perspective um, to take a certain type of case in Oregon um, versus uh, a different type of case in Oregon. Uh, so part of part of the answer is that it's going to be a long-term sort of sequential strategy, um, focusing on first the areas where our um, ideal state of the law is already pretty close to what the state of the law currently is, um, uh, and so that is a much that that situation would be a much easier lift so um so i can't give you a concise list of we're looking i can't give you right now a concise list of cases of uh, cases or circumstances that we're looking for um partly i don't know where you are um and partly uh you know a case that we might be perfectly happy to take in a year and a half or three years or you know um is not a case that we want to take today because there's two or three steps we need to take in between now and then. Um, uh, so uh, again, it's a great question. Unfortunately, it's one that I cannot give you a, a straightforward answer to. 
that's actually it's part of the reason I made you answer that question is because I want I want everyone to know that um, this stuff is very complicated and challenging, and that um, it's it's uh, it would be a lot easier for us to say, look, it's in this book. The answer is right here. Um, but that's not uh, the answers are rarely that concise and rarely that simple. Um, a lot of times it's it's very complicated and it takes a very long, uh, hard slog to get to where we want to be. Um, some of the other stuff, again, just to reiterate, is we don't have to just fight these battles in the courts. We can fight them in state legislatures. We can work on standing, meaning making it easier for us to access the court system. That's something that Allison is uh, really taking a look at and that we are uh, leading on in a number of uh, in a number of places, uh, but also just reining in uh, excesses um, in the in the legislature, uh, excesses that have crept in over time, um, things like the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. Um, a lot of the lawsuits uh, that have made their way to the Supreme Court that have just blown open the doors for all these religious exemptions are under RIFRA, um, not under the Constitution. And those are different things. And so all we have to do is say, this law is not subject to RIFRA. <laughs> uh, and that's that. That's sort of like the whole the thing about step one, draw a line. Step two, draw an owl, like as, as far as like how to draw an owl. How do How do we win this battle? Just say it doesn't apply. Well, yes, that's it's slightly more complicated than that. And there are a bunch of steps in the middle that I'm kind of glossing over, uh, but it is something that we're actively working on um, so that we're not just focusing on one uh, avenue of attack, uh, but rather looking at this from all angles. So I uh, wanted to mention that Bonnie is in South Carolina yeah. and she is one of the people that was doing a whole bunch of atheist voter stuff back when primaries were a thing that could happen. <laughs> <Wonderful>. <laughs> um, <laughs> And so I kind of wanted to segue into maybe Jeff, you saying something about Atheist Engage and Atheist Voter and ways to engage in our new lockdown state and not being able to do things in person. Um, sure. How much time do you have? <laughs> Forever. <laughs> Just a few minutes. <laughs> uh, okay. um, yeah, right now in particular, um, you know, there are not going to be in the foreseeable future um you know massive campaign rallies there are not going to be opportunities to go to uh see presidential candidates uh, apparently just today justin amash announced he's running he's considering a run as a libertarian um that'll that'll be interesting but um the uh, the opportunities to go out and and you know meet these candidates in person and engage with them face to face uh, is going to be a challenge, if not completely impossible. Um, and as a result, our focus has to be on engaging with these candidates and with government officials in general on social media. And um, it is, uh, I'm gonna try and give my like 30 to 45 minute presentation in three to four and a half minutes. Um, <laughs> the uh, it, Social media is, um, and the Supreme Court has even said, social media is the new, uh, uh, you know, town square. There is no more effective way to get your voice out there. And um, the First Amendment applies to government-operated social media accounts. Uh, that means that if you put, a, if if your city council member, if your um, if your county animal control department has a Facebook page and they start posting scripture or something on there, um, you should comment and say not to do that. If they, if your government officials or if people campaigning, uh, engage with people who are campaigning, but because they aren't necessarily current government officials, the First Amendment doesn't um, preclude them from censoring you in a campaign setting which is why it's complicated. But in terms of government officials um, on social media, um, pointing out on those platforms when they are taking steps that degrade the separation between religion and government, and when they are taking steps that strengthen the separation between religion and government, we should be out there either um, uh, pointing out how they could be doing things better or thanking them and encouraging them to continue doing the right thing. Um, and, uh, and, and it's important that you do so as an atheist. Um, one of the problems our community faces is, uh, uh, our, you know, we've, we've mentioned Christian nationalism a lot, 
this uh, this call. And um, Christianity is a fantastic umbrella um, term that encompasses a bunch of different viewpoints. A Christian nationalist could be a, uh, I was about to say a Buddhist, but they wouldn't be Buddhist, a Baptist, <laughs> um, uh, or a, um, uh, or a Seventh-day Adventist, uh, any number of different perspectives, um, but they all refer to themselves as Christian. Part of our problem as a community is that while there is a term, atheist, that, uh, that describes us all, plenty of us have legitimate concerns about using that label publicly. Um, if you are in a position where you can engage with an elected official and comfortably do so with uh, openly as an atheist, it's important that you say, I am a member of the atheist community and this policy um, uh, you know, could be better because um, X, Y, and Z. Um, and uh, because it, it A, draws attention to your comment uh, or your tweet or what have you, because these officials don't generally encounter people who just openly say, I'm an atheist and this affects my community this way. Um, it also, it, the more people do that, the more it conveys the actual size of our constituency. We are, depending on how you measure, somewhere between 20 and 30% of the population, um, but we are woefully underrepresented in Congress, in state houses, in governor's man. Well, we're completely, as far as I know, unrepresented in governor's mansions. Um, uh, and we also don't vote in proportion to our actual, um, the, the actual size of our, uh, of our population. Um, <clears throat> sorry, this is, I'm trying to condense a bunch of information down uh, in, into a very short span of time. Um, so it's important to, engage with your government officials, whether the actions they're doing are positive or negative. Um, it's important that you do so as an atheist, and it's important that you do so on their officially controlled government social media platforms, because if they try and censor you, if they block you, if they delete your comment, if they decry you as a, you know, a hateful atheist or a godless heathen or something like that, they are trying to chill your speech when they do that, and they are infringing your right to the freedom of speech when they do that, and we will happily sue them for that, because that is the most important right that any of us have as Americans, and it's important that, um, that we preserve it for our community. Um, so uh, if you do engage with your government officials, be it on social media, be it on Facebook, uh, Twitter, Instagram, TikTok, I don't know, can you interact with people on TikTok? I don't even know. Uh, <laughs> um, we're very hip here let at American a, Let Atheists. us know what you do it, because, sorry. I said we're very hip here at American Atheists. Oh, TikTok. yes, I'm totally. I think we have I, a I, website. I, sadly. Right? I mean, we could just uh, refer people yeah. there to, what's the website? Yeah. Engage? Atheistengage.org. Uh, atheist okay. um, I just want to add one, one, finish my point here, because uh, when you do, uh, when you do engage with government officials, let us know, because we can amplify those messages. And, um, and, in so doing, you are also documenting that you interacted. If they later on go back and delete your comment, you have a screenshot. You have something showing that you interacted with them that we can use to substantiate a claim that they violated your rights by censoring you. So this is the website. Um, if you are censored, please let me know. Uh, and that's that. Great. Not quite three and a half minutes, but. <laughs> Good enough. Um, all right. Um, Sam, was there anything else you wanted to add on that? Nope. Okay. Um, well, we've gone a bit over time. <laughs> we've gone about half an hour over, uh, and that's okay. Um, we wanted to, we had some really great questions from folks um, that we wanted to try to get to as many as, um, as many as possible. Uh, and so I, I appreciate the uh, many, many of you who stuck around throughout this. Um, and uh, just let you know that we will be doing uh, hopefully future uh, engagements online. Um, I don't quite know what form they're going to take. Um, we may use different platforms. We may uh, try Facebook. We may try YouTube. Um, we want to engage with folks uh, where you are. We want to have these conversations so you can learn more about what we're doing uh, and that you can get your questions answered and we can, um, you know, continue a dialogue with um, the, the people of our community who we rely on uh, for not just the financial resources to keep going, but also the activist resources, the time resources that all of you 
uh, so generously uh, give to us uh, is really critical for all the work that we do. Um, so I just wanted to um, thank you all for all of that. Thank you for being here today uh, and remind everyone that uh, this will be posted online and we will send it to you uh, once it is, uh, and then you can share it with anybody who wasn't able to attend, uh, who maybe wanted to learn a little bit more about the work that we're doing. Uh, and just lastly, if you have not yet done so uh, while on this webinar, while in this town hall, please stop by atheists.org slash act and sign up for our action alerts. Put in your email there and we'll uh, make sure you find out about what's going on in your community and when you can uh, take that action that Allison's promising about confirming good judges, uh, but also when you can submit comments to the Small Business Administration about the, the, these loans, um, comments to the Education Department, that, or no, I'm sorry, HHS, uh, about <laughs> religious discrimination, uh, turning patients away on the basis of their religion of their providers, uh, when there's an event in your area, uh, or when there's anything going on that we might need some help with, uh, but also when we're just going to be there and we want to connect with you. Um, that's a great way to, to dip your toes in and, and get a little bit more involved. Um, with that, uh, I'll just open it up one more time to any of our panelists, any of the staff who are here, if you'd like to add anything. Um, anyone? No, thank you. It's great to speak with you all. I'm sorry we didn't get to see you at the convention, but next time. <laughs> we will see you soon in Arizona, but we will also see you soon online uh, in more of these events. And so thank you so much for attending. Uh, and with that, uh, we will call it a night. Thank you again. Night.